one, we are recording. Paul, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, gl glad, to, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, read, <clears throat> I read the review of your book, The Explaining Evil. And for people who don't know, you did your, uh, your PhD work on it. And mm -hmm. do, can you give us like a brief introduction into the book because it's it's yeah. it's got two theists and two atheists right right yeah so um the, the 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 broad strokes of the book is that i there are scores and scores of books already on the problem of evil um and so um i was really trying to think of a, a way of trying to add something new to the discussion and um several years ago it occurred to me that um one of the things that is um, unique, or, or the, sorry, is that is lacking, is that um, oftentimes in these discussions about the problem of evil, there's not a lot of opportunity for um, atheists to say why they think there is evil. So I was just kind of um, setting, um, you know, thinking about that for a while, and then it, it occurred to me that maybe this would, uh, a book like this would be a good opportunity for um, atheists to be able to provide their explanation for evil. And also uh, an opportunity for theists to do, to do the same, because in at least in most of the things that I've read or that I'm familiar with on the problem of evil, it really is a, they're they're set up around the problem, um, and it's almost always taken to be the a problem for theists, right? So mm -hmm. a theist has some beliefs in a in a traditional god, and in some way or another, uh, the presence of evil makes that belief either uh, unlikely or it's incompatible with the presence of evil. However, you want to spell out the problem, um, and so um, the the many times, not all the time, but many times, the debate sort of unfolds in a way where um, an, an atheist sort of um, presents this problem and then the theist spends all of their time trying to solve the problem and in sometimes whenever they, they do that they never actually get around to saying well here's why i think there is evil they just focus on trying to um show why it's not it doesn't create a problem and not actually just provide their own explanation and so uh, in the introduction to the book I, I sort of point out that this isn't a traditional problem of evil book in in that sort of way in that um i don't think anyone ever even articulates the, the, the problem of evil in, in the book. Um, and so what I'd asked each of the authors to do uh, is to just from their own worldview, just say, here's why I think there is evil. Hmm. Absent, uh, absent any uh, specific objection that's being raised. Like, you know, if somebody just walks up to them and says, hey, why is there evil? Well, what are they going to say? Um, and that was sort of what it, so there, you're right, there are, there are two uh, theists, um, Richard Davis, a colleague of mine at uh, Tyndale University, a uh, former professor of yours. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he wrote one chapter um, on sort of presenting more of a libertarian account. Uh, and then Paul Helm, a really well-known prominent uh, Christian philosopher who's uh, more on the, the Calvinist or compatibilistic side of things, uh, he provides his account. And so you get some, some interesting uh, exchanges from the two uh, theists in, in that they uh, have a pretty wide uh, disparate uh, views among their theism. And then the same is true among the atheists as well. And so uh, Michael Ruse, uh, um, he's you know well-known uh, philosopher of science, um, and he argues for sort of a, from an atheistic um, uh, moral non-realism account, right? So mm. he's sort of skeptical about whether there's objective morality at all. And then uh, Eric Wielenberg is another atheist, but uh, does think that we have that uh, he can, has the resources to talk about objective morality. And so then he spells out those details as it specifically relates to to evil. And so uh, between the four different ones, there's a lot of different kind of views being presented. And then um, in the replies to the lead chapters, you see some really interesting sort of mm. um, allegiances or uh, alliances emerging. Uh, against certain views in certain respects, but not others and things like that. So, so that's kind of a, a brief uh, recap uh, uh, of the book. Yeah. How do you go about getting for, I mean, uh, uh, with, with Rich, it's much easier because you work with him, but yeah, with the yeah. other three guys, how would you, how do you go about uh, getting scholars to be like, okay, I'm writing a book. Uh, I want to edit a yeah. book and do you mind yeah. writing for it? Or is there an incentive for them? Um, well, I, I, it's a little bit, uh, it's more of a just yes to, I know that was an either or question, but, um, uh, <laughs> uh the, the answer is just yes. So, uh, basically I just sort of, um, you know, put in a short, uh, uh, description of the project, what I just yeah. kind of had explained to you and then reached out to, to some people to see who, who was available and who was interested. And so for them, it's, um, uh, 
and just an opportunity to sort of um, push their own ideas. I think mm -hmm. I think um, all four of them were really um, uh, interested. Some have done things like this in the past, but uh, not the uh, not all of them. Uh, as far as that. Um, the debate sort of a style book where you have you publish an essay and then you immediately get feedback and then you can ch have a chance to respond. Uh, and so, you know, uh, it's just another uh, interesting um, or new way for people to sort of test out their ideas and to to get their ideas um, out to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, that there uh, is very little, if any, financial incentive for, <laughs> for these things, just the deep gratitude from the, uh, the editor. Uh, and, but so I think most people really just see it as an opportunity to, to uh, have another venue, uh, maybe a different, different venue um, to express their ideas instead of just say through um, uh, uh, peer reviewed uh, journal articles that don't necessarily have a broad reach to the, to the general public. Um, and then but maybe they don't want to take the time to write an entire book on it, uh, mm -hmm. on this topic, but they, they have some things that they want to say about the topic. And so this is sort of a short manageable way for them to get those ideas out. I, I suspect for uh, all four of them are, you know, really well established, uh, full professors of philosophy. And so they probably had lots of other things they could have been doing as well. So I just think it was sort of just an interesting kind of project that sort of piqued their interest is what finally led them to say uh, say yes. Do you okay? So just just out of curiosity, when you when you're writing a book, because I don't because most people would never get around to writing a book, and if they do write a book, it's usually um, self published in some form. Mm -hmm. But your obviously your book is published by I'm trying to remember who the publisher is. Uh, Bloomsbury. Bloomsbury, right? Yeah. So when you're going about with the publisher, is it how does the how does it go from like the beginning to the end? Yeah. Um, you know, like what's, what's the relation like for you yeah. as the editor with the, yeah. uh, with the writer, the publisher? Yeah. Yeah. So that it's sort of, um, unfolds and, and kind of, uh, in stages. And so, um, you know, first, um, uh, I, I knew someone else who had published a similar book, uh, with Bloomsbury, uh, Paul Gould, uh, he had, oh, had published yeah, yeah. a book on, um, God and abstract objects. Okay, yeah. Um, and so I've said, Hey, Paul, who is, who did you talk to? And he gave me the name of the, the commissioning editor at Bloomsbury. And so, uh, I emailed uh, him to see if he was interested in the idea. And he said he was, and asked me to put together a, a full proposal. And so there's a big long form that you fill out and you give all of these details and, um, sort of give a, a precy what the book would be like. And for an edited book, um, at that stage, you sort of say, um, I haven't asked anybody to write for it yet. This is what I, the way I did it. I guess other people could do it the other ways, but I said, I haven't asked anybody, uh, but here's who I have in mind. Uh, here's the kinds of people that I would have in mind. And usually um, for each of the positions, I had a couple of different options. Uh, and that way Bloomsbury could um, sort of see before they said, yeah, this is something we're really interested in. They could kind of see the, 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 the feel. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, it didn't work out in my case, but I imagine in some cases, if um, the, actual authors are really different from the proposed author, you probably would want to run that by the, the editor. But in my case, there was, there was almost a complete um, uh, lineup between uh, uh, who I proposed to them. And so, um, you, you know, for them, they want to see that the people that are contributing it are actually um, have something to say on, on the topic and that they're, they're knowledgeable and that it's going to make a, a contribution to the literature. Um, this book is sort of in one of those, um, areas where it's you you want it to make a contribution to other philosophers and their academic work you want it to be a contribution to the literature but you also want it to be accessible mm. to non-specialists and that's a really hard line that's sort of the golden mean that everybody wants to aim at uh, you know advance the the discussion in the field but also have keep it accessible to non-specialists um and um I was really happy to, I think that we, that, that, that each of the authors did a good job of that, where uh, if you do work in moral philosophy, or if you do work on the problem of evil, or uh, if you just do work on evil itself, outside of the problem of evil, just on evil itself, I think there's things that would be helpful in the book. But at the same time, I don't think that it requires you to have a, a, a specialty in any of these areas in order for you to sort of follow the line of argument and, and learn something and, and maybe have your own ideas tested. Is it... Um... As, as an academic philosopher, do you find that <clears throat> in a lot of cases, the research that's being done is not accessible to the normal person out of philosophy, outside of philosophy? Uh, I think that's probably true for a lot, a lot of it. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons why. Um, 
I think one reason why is just not everybody is even aware of how to go about finding the research that is there. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of people um, who are smart, they have, um, you know, education, they could follow the, the line of argument in a lot of the things that are published in philosophy, but they don't even know that something like fill papers exists. And so that they could just go and, and look for things that are interesting. And, and many times you can find, um, if it's not an open access journal, a lot of times um, authors will publish like a self-formatted version to fill papers, which you know um, most publishers are fine for them to do. And for somebody in, who's not needing to cite it as, far to, as part of a, a project they're working on, that's perfectly fine. It's the ideas are the same, right? It's just the formatting and pages are different. Um, so I think a lot of people just don't know what's there. Um, and then uh, the other reason is some, there are certain things, certain topics um, that just really require years and years of, of careful thought and attention in order to really have something new to say. And, um, and there's just a lot of people in the non, who aren't professional academic philosophers just don't have the time for that, right? They have, other, they have their actual job to worry about. They have their kids, they have their, their church, or they have their, their other activities. And so they don't have the time to do that. And I don't, I, I, there's a lot of, um, you know, murmuring at, at various points, uh, I think about whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. And, and I, I think like, like most things in, in the extreme, it's, it's bad if uh, all you're publishing are things that nobody, that it can't really benefit. Well, maybe that's not great, but oftentimes what I've, what I've found is there are people who do really highly technical work and other people draw on that. And maybe what those other people are doing is accessible to the broader public. And so it kind of sort of uh, channel or feeds itself down, uh, down the line. Um, and so, but I, I do think you're right that there are, um, uh, there's a lot of work out there that just is completely, um, uh, the public is just completely unaware. I keep hearing statistics about how many people actually read uh, peer review journal articles. And then as soon as I see that's where they're going, I just ignore them because I don't want to know because it'll be depressing for all the things that I've written and like one person has read it or something like that. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> but you know, there, there are, there, I think there are some, I think it's worthwhile for philosophers to uh, at times think about um, how is what am I, how is there a way that the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. can be, um, you know, transmitted and, and communicated to a broader audience? Um, and, and actually, I, I think what we might see, and we're probably already starting to see the beginning of that, is that uh, things like this, that I think a lot of that might actually come through podcasts where mm -hmm. you go and you do your, your specialized work and you get it published in a peer-reviewed article uh, or journal, uh, and then uh, somebody says, hey, uh, that's really interesting. Um, you know, you want to come on my podcast and talk about it. And then whenever you're chatting about it, you can then talk about it in maybe a different kind of way that you're not worrying about trying to get it through peer review. You're trying to communicate to this broader audience. And so you can expand your explanations as needed. You can draw on different examples as needed and those sorts of things. Um, actually, um, next week, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a, a video podcast about one of my journal articles. So just um, for that very reason, somebody read it and said, hey, I've got a, a podcast uh, on YouTube, a, a show. Uh, you want to come on it and, and talk about your, your, your article? And okay, sure. Um, so there's that one guy. He was the one that read that one. And so he wants to talk about it on his podcast. So, and then he can distribute it, you know, because yeah, you have his, his audience. Yeah. Right. Because I think there, I think the, I, I mean, what COVID has done, whether it's good or bad is that it has made a lot of academics think, okay, you know, if I could, I could record all my lectures and put it up and then mm -hmm. someone could do the same thing and put it all up. And <clears throat> There's, there's, there's a real um, sense of, at least from some of the academics I've spoken, there's a real sense of uh, worry for what might happen in the future as, th as things are going online. But I do think that, you know, for example, I think you've been on other podcasts before, right? I think uh, yeah, I, yeah, a couple. I, I, I listened to the one with you and um, your friend, the French philosopher. Oh, Guillaume. Guillaume, yes. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Justin Brierley's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. I listened to that, and that was great. That was, you know, it was a great way for people to hear two academics talk about it, but in a way that you know a normal person with no philosophy, maybe maybe a little bit of philosophy background is needed to kind of understand the terms. But it it kind of uh, what's the word? This disseminates the idea into yeah, the public. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of 
I, I know we, we will get back to the book. I do want to talk about no, the book. Um, yeah, but I am curious to know your thoughts on um, <clears throat> paywall journals or mm. just because, and I, I, I admit this because I'm no longer in grad school. So I, I'm, I think I'm okay to say this. <clears throat> but there are times when there were um, articles that I couldn't access because. My, mm. Yeah, there were times when I couldn't act, either because I forgot my password from my from my university, so I couldn't access their public. So there, there there's a, there's a website called SciHub. Mm. Have you heard of SciHub? No. Okay. Yeah. So I, SciHub, it's a great resource for anyone who has no affiliation to university because what SciHub yeah. does, and it's been people have tried to shut it down lots of times, and I don't yeah. I don't know how successful it's been, but SciHub unlocks walled uh, paywall oh, I see. journals, which I obviously I understand the the ethical conundrum behind it, but right. I, their whole goal is to make um, scientific research accessible to human humans. I think they say humans, so that there's more right. innovation that comes about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I think, I mean, there, there's like, like most things, there's um, the, the devils and the details on, on pay, pay and, and not. And um, one of the things, one of the, the benefits, I think, of having um, this sort of system that we have is it can, it's a way of helping to ensure there is um, a level of quality and rigor. Because uh, so, you know, ha just having a, uh, an email address that's connected to a university I would say every week I get probably five to six emails from people saying, hey, uh, we have a, a special issue, a special volume uh, that we want you to edit. Um, and you can pick your authors, you can do whatever you want. Um, and you think, oh, that's great. And then you find out that it's open access mm -hmm. and which isn't in of itself bad, um, but it, there are certain places where they use it. It's basically just a a way to it's almost a form of vanity publishing so if you give them enough money um, they'll stick it in their journal right now certainly it's not the case that all open access journals are like that but many of them are mm -hmm. um and so i i there are a, a handful of journals that are starting to move to sort of a um a hybrid model uh where um it sort of has the traditional paywall. And so there's a traditional, uh, you know, well-established editorial team um, that reviews and guides, you know, takes things through the, the blind review process. And so you, you know that it's not some guy who just wants to pad his CV by paying for articles getting published. You know, it's, there's a rigorous process, um, just like, you know, uh, the traditional one, but then they will have the, uh, the option of, if you want, you can make this open access, hmm. uh, and some institutions will um, fund that for the for their um, faculty scholars, uh, so that you, you know. But many of them, it could be you know several thousand dollars to pay to have something be uh, available uh, via open access, and so. Um, I think we'll probably start to see things uh, shift a little bit with um, now that so many people are. Uh, if you think about, you know, maybe 40 years ago, the only way these journals were getting published is that there was somebody who was actually collecting the papers, printing them off, binding them, mailing them out, and all of that costs money, right? And so you needed to have a system that would be able to fund that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, now, whenever it's all done on online uh, and it's done by a PDF, the, the, the monetary resources to sort of usher that through is far lower. And so I think over time, we'll start to see more and more journals um, keep the uh, peer reviewed process in place that they have now, but then have either really inexpensive uh, fees to, to get access or make it free. So I'm, I'm on the executive for the uh, Evangelical Philosophical Society. And you can get online access to the entire EPS catalog for I think $25 a year. I mean, it's wow, basically it. nothing, right? Um, and so like, it's really, really affordable. Um, yeah. The Society of Christian Philosophers, um, they recently made uh, access to uh, their journal of uh, faith and philosophy is just open access, uh, just entirely. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that they don't charge their authors for that. And so, um, so then authors can continue to contribute to the journal and it goes through the, the same peer review process. Um, but there's just the, 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 the resources that the, the financial resources that are needed to have a, a journal be published online are just far lower. There's still some there and I'm sure they have donors and, and, um, you know, their general, um, um, 
uh, annual membership fees and stuff that will help cover, cover, cover some of that, but it's just far lower. And so I hope that what we'll see is over time, more and more people moving to that sort of a model where it, those who do have an interest that don't have a university affiliation, it's not some enormous burden. Like if you go to some of these journals and you just want to read that one journal, you're like that, that one article and they're like, it's $60. You're like, <laughs> Who's going to pay $60 to read that? They're going to go to the place that you said. Um, but for any, any readers, uh, or any uh, viewers, um, if you are unsure about the the ethics of using these other other assets, uh, uh, um, uh, ways of accessing it, if the author is alive, you can probably find their email address, and almost all of them will be more than happy to send you because there's one more person that might right. actually read my article. Yes, I'll <laughs> send it to you right away. Um, and so uh, it's obviously harder to do whenever they're dead, but uh, if, they're, if they're alive, um, I, I think that could be a, a really helpful um, uh, way of being able to get that. But again, that requires people to know that it's appropriate to do that and to know yeah. that nobody will be offended by that. And, and I don't think any publishers uh, even have any rules against you emailing a, another person a copy of the PDF. Uh, I'm not aware of any, I could be wrong about that, but. Uh, most authors, if they won't send you the actual PDF off print, they'll at least send you their own self-formatted version, which no publishers care about. So this, um, yeah, that's this really interesting, um, uh, sort of a, a topic to, to think about. I haven't really thought very seriously about it all that much, so it's, uh, hopefully it wasn't too rambling uh, no, in my off-the-cuff it, it makes sense. If you, you're talking about authors. Um, I'm thinking David Odenberg, the philosopher at, at I forget what university he's at, um, <clears throat> Nottingham, maybe he said Nottingham University. I mm -hmm. could be wrong, but he has all, all his uh, peer-reviewed articles on his website, so you can just download it. Well, there you go. It. So I mean, there are there are definitely people who are, who just be like, okay, here's my stuff. You can just download it for free. Yeah. Well, and a lot of them will put it on uh, fill papers, um, and so I, I don't know if other academic disciplines have something akin to fill. Or maybe it's fill people now. I can't remember that it, it either was fill people and it's now fill papers or vice versa. Um, but um, you can get a, access to a lot of articles very easily um, through through fill papers um, yeah. and. You know, like it's, uh, who knows if other other academic resources have have or uh, disciplines have the same sort of a thing. But for those who are who are interested in philosophy, I think that's a, a great way to to um, at least get started. And you can probably find a, a lot of what you're looking for through there. So okay, to go back to what we originally said we were going to talk about, which is obviously a book. Could you, for anyone who doesn't know or have ever come across the problem of evil? It, within philosophy, can you give like a uh, philosophy 101 version sure. of it? Well, the, the very simplest version is um, basically if God is so great, if he's so powerful, if he's so loving, um, why is there evil? Like wouldn't a, if so, you know, just sort of, this is kind of how uh, it, it appears in uh, Hume's dialogues. Uh, if, if God is omnipotent, he would be able to either eradicate evil or even better prevent it from occurring in the first place. Um, if he's, uh, if he's all knowing, he would know how to do it. And if he's wholly good, he would want to do that. And so if you have a being who is capable of doing it, uh, would want to do it and knows how to do it, then you shouldn't have any evil. Um, so that's kind of the, the the basic problem. Now, there's variations of the problem of evil. Um, uh, some will, uh, sort of presented in a way where evil is su supposed to somehow be logically incompatible with the very being of God. So that's kind of what the, the, the version I just said, we unpack the uh, attributes of God, that kind of being could not logically exist uh, with, with evil. And then others will present it in a slightly different way where it's, it's not uh, one of uh, logical incompatibility, but just likelihood. Like, uh, look, I mean, okay, yeah, so God and evil could logically coexist, but look at all this evil. That surely that makes it less likely that God exists than, uh, or some people will say it, um, put it slightly differently. Um, evil's existence uh, is very surprising if God exists, um, but if there is no God, it's not very surprising at all. Um, and so it sort of counts against God's existence. And so um, most theists, whenever they are interacting with the problem of evil, it's it's one of those sort of sort of versions. Um, yeah, obviously there's better, more finely fine grained ways of of putting those problems, but that's the the gist of it. Is if God 
why evil? Uh, mm. That's uh, Norm Geisler uh, has a book uh, on the problem of evil, and that's just its title. If God, why evil? Um, and uh, you know, for me, I, I think that it uh, is a perfectly natural question to ask. Um, it it does seem surprising. Um, why would there be this stuff? Like, if God's so great, why not just get rid of it? Uh, and and then whenever you start trying to unpack. Uh, the responses to that, that's whenever you get into a lot of really interesting things about, uh, at least on my view, about human freedom, uh, mm -hmm. about uh, God's uh, power, what we mean by God's omnipotence, those sorts of things. Um, and so, but that's sort of the the thumbnail sketch of what the problem is. Um, and then there's a whole host of different ways of trying to to resolve the problem. Is there, so I, I was reading in the review with uh, Brian, uh, Brian, Rich Davis. <clears throat> His was that... Um, Evil only makes sense if God exists, correct? Yeah. Something along yeah. the lines of that. Yeah. Uh, so his view is what he, he calls, uh, he, he, it's, he will regularly refer to uh, the just act, ACT, uh, agent causal theism. And so the, the idea is, uh, on, on Rich's view, is he, he was says, what would need to be true in order for there to be evil like what kinds of things have to be true about reality for evil to really exist for it to be mm. really and truly and genuinely evil and uh on his view you need to have an agent that's capable of producing evil uh so you need some type of consciousness uh some kind of conscious agent um and and for various reasons uh, on his view it's an immaterial conscious agent so you need uh, a that's the kind of thing that could generate a moral choice or, or, or it could engage in an evil action. So you, you need an immaterial conscious agent that is able to act freely. And so on, on his view, if you have this uh, immaterial conscious agent, but it's not one that can act freely, uh, well then um, whatever uh, actions this thing engages in, they could be really harmful, but they wouldn't be evil because it's not done freely. So on his view, evil uh, requires a free choice. And so um, the way he unpacks uh, his essay is to say that those are the things that we need in order for there to be evil choices at all. How do we get uh, conscious, immaterial, or immaterial conscious agents who can act freely? And then he goes through his, an argument to unpack that, that we can really only get that if there is a God. And so the way he sort of processes that argument is he says, well, um, there's various options that you might think could produce such a thing, and mm. here's why they don't. Uh, and so uh, he considers actually um, Michael Ruse's position, the uh, purely some sort of Darwinian uh, evolutionary uh, account of, of just uh, human origins. And he says, on that sort of view, you don't get human freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and then he also considers uh, Paul Helm's view. Um, on, so on, on Helm's view, you, you could get the immaterial conscious agents, but um, on Helm's view, you, you don't have the free part of it. And so on either, either case, um, you either don't have the immaterial conscious agent part or you don't have the free, uh, the free part uh, or both, uh, depending on, on how you want to process the argument. And so uh, that's sort of you're left with the option of, well, guess what? Um, theism does the job very nicely. It, uh, uh, if God exists, um, he could create uh, the, the, the universe in a, in a way where you have the ability uh, to make these sorts of free actions as a, uh, at root, a, a material conscious agent. And so um, on his, yeah, his view, it's sort of as ruling out Calvinism as one uh, uh, arena for a plausible explanation and also Darwinism. And so then he is left with his, his sort of view. So it's kind of a, uh, eliminating options, uh, sort of, sort of approach. Is, is <clears throat> on Rich's view, it, it's not evil that a lion would hunt a deer. It wouldn't be considered evil. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what was really interesting, um, and I, I made note of this in my introduction, but I didn't prior to, I didn't want to like bias any of the authors one way or the other. And so I gave them very little like guidance. Uh, I just said, look, answer, why do you think there is evil according to your worldview? And then just sort of like let my hands off the, the wheel to see what would happen. Um, and all four of them sort of a approached it in the same that kind of came around to the same sort of thing where they were all focusing on um so what 
what philosophers have typically or traditionally called moral evil. And so it's really common. Um, I don't know who did it first, but I think probably it was Alvin Plantinga who did it first really well in a memorable way, um, distinguish between moral evil and natural evil. And so uh, a moral evil is just evil that um, results from the actions of a moral agent. Uh, whereas natural evil is evil that is, uh, doesn't result from the, the, the actions of a moral agent. And so um, a lion devouring the lamb, lions aren't moral agents, so that's not evil. Um, a tsunami, uh, or sorry, that would be natural evil, pardon me. Uh, that would be a natural evil because it's a, not a moral agent. Um, a tsunami uh, wiping out an island, again, that's not a moral agent, so that would be natural evil. Um, a couple of the authors specifically said, look, I'm not even talk, I'm just not going to talk about natural evil at all. I was Roos who doesn't think there is any such thing as natural evil. Mm. Um, and that was actually the position I was starting to try and defend in the introduction is um, I'm becoming more and more convinced. I'm not def definitive at this point. I'm willing to, to listen to arguments to the contrary, but I'm really swayed uh, by this view that just evil just is a moral notion. And so I'm inclined to think that there is no such thing as natural evil. Um, at the same time, I, I think that suffering caused by natural events is something that Christians or the theists should still need to explain. So like, I'm not trying to say there is no natural evil to sort of make the job of responding to the problem of evil easier. I just think that it would be a different solution. Uh, so um, whatever you say about the problem of evil um, may not have anything to do at all with the problem of nature-based suffering or, you know, I don't have a catchy name for it, um, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's never been my strong suit. Um, but there's, there's, there, there's clearly suffering that results from moral agents and there's suffering that results from non-moral uh, agents like tsunamis or lions. Um, I just don't think that second category is evil. And so on, on Rich's view, he doesn't argue that, but that sort of is part of the assumption is here's what I'm at least focusing on right now. And so I'm not sure um, if, uh, if he would uh, agree with me that there just is no natural evil. Uh, but if he thinks there is natural evil, he would, you're right, he would have to ha add to his explanation for evil something that would cover that. And so th there's a lot of ways that people might do that. I, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but uh, in his uh, some might say um, the natural evil that we see is actually truly still a result of moral agency, uh, namely the fall, right? So um, it, the fall itself uh, was a moral event. Uh, and so all of the natural evil that we see is a consequence of the fall. And so it still could be rightly considered a type of moral evil. Um, um, others might say, um, it's the demons that are causing things and they're moral agents. And so they're causing the tsunamis or they're causing the lion to eat the lamb or they're causing the cancer or those sorts of things. Uh, and so that, you know, maybe you would still have some sort of a, a way of trying to, to fold those explanations in together. But I'm just inclined to think it might be best to say, here's my explanation for why there is evil. And let's talk about this other stuff just in an entirely different way, instead of trying to have one account of, the, of evil that covers both moral-based evil and this natural-based suffering, I'm, I kind of think that maybe that's led us astray. Uh, and so we should just have two, we have like the problem of evil and then the problem of natural nature-based suffering or natural, you know, uh, suffering based upon uh, natural causes. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a bit of a of a sticky issue. But it, in the book, the book is clearly only uh, concerned with uh, the moral variety. So if you think that there's moral and natural evil, that that's fine. Just the book is only addressing one of those two. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, it was just interesting that I didn't ask them to to take it in that way. That's just sort of the way things uh, things unfolded. Um, so is your position is your position similar to Michael Michael Roos's position in terms of the distinction that he makes? Um, yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, and I don't think it's just him. I think Wielenberg might say this as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think in that respect, uh, I probably am, uh, have, am similar to Ruse that I just don't think there is natural evil at all. Um, one of the things that really made me start to pay attention to this was, um, uh, you know, as a philosopher of religion, uh, my, my dissertation was um, at the University of Oklahoma was on the problem of evil. I spent a lot of time reading atheists talking about the problem of evil and theists talking about the problem of evil. 
And then uh, several years ago, I started just reading just regular philosophers who work on evil itself. Uh, one of my professors at Oklahoma, uh, near at Badwar, um, I took a, it was, she was actually the first time I, had, I considered this and then I kind of set it aside for several years and then came back to it. But um, uh, it, it, I took a course with, with uh, Professor Badwar at Oklahoma and um, we were talking just about evil just evil outside the context of the problem of evil outside the context of philosophy of religion just evil as a just a, a, a concept um, and whenever i started rereading some literature that uh, we read then and then some new things I, I realized everybody who's talking about evil just as a concept is talking about moral evil <laughs> like no one ever I, I i couldn't find anybody who defined evil as a concept in a way that has these two categories moral evil and natural evil and so i kind of thought well you know, it's the people who just are working on evil as a concept all seem to think that it's just a moral notion and that's just it. And so maybe it is. And, and if it is just a moral notion, maybe in some way that will impact our how we try to respond to the problem of evil, um, where it would be natural to have one set of solutions to the problem of evil that maybe has nothing to do whatsoever with the problem of suffering based upon these natural causes. Um, so kind of trying to, to drive a wedge between um, these two kinds of different problems are similar in that they both are related to suffering. Um, and so uh, I, I guess uh, one, one might respond and say, well, what if we just talk about the problem of suffering instead of the problem of evil? Um, and I, cause then so that does have a more of a catch all term, just suffering. Um, but I, I would probably be inclined then to say, well, there are two kinds of suffering. <laughs> there's suffering that results from evil and there's suffering that results from natural causes. And then we write right, right, right back where right. we are. So I'm not sure that that would, that would help. What about the, uh, what about the, uh, the medieval concept of privation? Cause that, that, that has a all encompassing, it, it, yeah. you know, the moral evil, I mean, if you if you follow Aquinas, if you're a Thomist, then you know moral evil is explainable via some sort of privation, and then yeah. natural evil, the same same thing is privation. What what are your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, that's that's really good. So I I think what I would probably say is, um, I don't think the point that I'm making um, makes would would cause somebody to take a, a position on the privation view. I think it would be uh, it's. I, seems pretty obviously consistent with somebody who thinks that v evil is not simply a privation. Um, but even those who do, I think what you might say is, well, whenever we talk about the causes of these privations, some of them are caused by moral agents doing bad things. And some of them are caused by, you know, weather patterns and, and natural diseases. Um, and so I, th I think, you know, if um, one of the things that I've, I've tried to to talk with my students about is uh, whenever we, we talk about the privation view is um, that doesn't do much to solve the problem of evil, right? If you say, well, why is there evil? And you say, well, really evil is a privation of the good. Well, then you're just going to say, well, why are there privations of good, <laughs> right? Um, and so then you still got to give an answer to it, right? And that's why uh, Augustine, you know, he does much more than spell out his privation theory, right? He does a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would be inclined to think um, is that uh, you could still have this distinction between evil and just this other kind of suffering. Um, both of them result in privations of good, uh, but only one of them is evil. And so that I don't know if Aquinas would agree with that or um, or Augustine would agree with that, um, but I, I think you that seems reasonable to me is just to, to push things and say okay well what's the cause of this privation and now you have two different the same categories as before mm -hmm. uh, and so the cause of one you might get one kind of uh, set of explanations and for the cause of the other a different set of explanations. So okay now what do you what do you think you're you're, the, you're you know Aquinas better than I do so <laughs> before I answer what I want to know is. So within the literature of the problem of evil, <clears throat> um, it's very common. I, I like from what I've read, it's very common to to talk about evil without any some sort any sort of definition. You know, it's like oh, there's yeah. evil, there's evil, there's evil, there's God, and there's no real definition that takes place. Now, and it's always almost always assumed that suffering and pain is equivalent to or synonymous with evil. And something yeah. that I've thought about over the over the over the over these years is. Not all suffering, at least if we take a trivial example of um, 
let's say, working out, or I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so when I go to the gym and someone strangles me or tries to break my arm, you know, it hurts a lot, <laughs> and I learn from that, yeah. okay, I got to stay away from this position, or yeah. if I'm working out, you know, you're working your muscles, and it, it hurts when you wake up the next morning. Yeah. Yeah, but we don't say that it's evil. We like we we wouldn't right. say that's evil, and the some and that that sort of suffering is something I've wondered. Is it when people say suffering is suffering is bad? Are they forgetting yeah. that there are certain suffering that, that that's actually good? Yeah, I I I'm I'm inclined to ag- to agree with you, though I think what some might say is, um, but couldn't God have constructed things in such a way where your muscles can grow without you having to experience the pain? Mm. Uh, I'm inclined to think that as you push, that's probably, you're going to see reasons to think that that's probably not the case. Um, um, You know, like uh, with the, uh, someone about to break your arm, it's not clear what (laughs) signal they could send to you other than the the feeling, the pain of your arm being broken. Mm. Right. Uh, And so I don't know that, that, is it, but I, I think that might be kind of how they respond is, mm. you know, but do we have to have the suffering to get the good that comes from it? Like, couldn't God have constructed in such a way where you get the goods without the suffering? And I, I'm, I'm not sure that that, that works as a sort of a, as a, as a, a response. Um, but I, I could see somebody trying to sort of run that, that line. Um, yeah. So there was something, there was two parts to the question. I answered the second part, but I forgot the first part. Um, uh, the sorry. second part was, are all suffering bad? I think that's what I was getting at. Yeah. So what was the first question? Okay. The first, what was my first question? <laughs> oh, that's my first question. Oh, my first question it wasn't, it wasn't a question. I was just making the point that there's uh, within the literature, oh, there isn't a definition. Definition. Yeah. A good definition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think you're right that um, there's very little attempt to define. Um, so um if you go back to, uh, so back to Plantinga again, um, in, you know, some of his early work on this, that's, you know, rightly well regarded. Um, he just says, um, you know, there just, there is evil. And then he gives some examples of it. Here's some examples of moral evil and here's some examples of natural evil. And, um, there are times that I think this lack of an attempt to define what we mean by the term, there are times that it sort of gets under my skin. Um, and then there are other times where I think, well, maybe you don't really need to it because the, whenever you're talking about the problem of evil, it, isn't it enough to just like point at something that's really terrible and be like, I don't, maybe I don't know what evil is, but I know that thing over there, that's really bad. Uh, mm-hmm. Why does God allow that? And you just sort of point at it and say, that seems like something God wouldn't have allowed if he mm-hmm. was as good and loving and powerful as you say he is. Um, and so, uh, I think where I I come down on it is that I do think it's a problem that not that enough not enough attention has been really spent on what we mean by the term, but it's it's really because I the the, the I think the problem with that is. Um, it obscures some of our solutions. I think that's part of the reason why we've, we have people trying to come up with one solution that covers all instances of evil. Or if I think we took some time to talk about, well, what does evil mean? And we said, well, if evil is just a moral concept, um, then these other ones doesn't really matter. Like, or it's not, it doesn't matter as it relates to the context of evil. And so now it would be more obvious to us that we need to, um, think of a different kind of a solution instead of trying to combine it into one. Mm. Um, But, you know, I, I I understand, you know, if, if somebody comes up to me and says, you know, look, you're, you're a Christian, you're a theist. um, Why is there evil? And I say, well, what do you mean by evil? And then they struggle trying to give an adequate definition of evil. Uh, And then, you know, like Socrates, uh, they, 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 or like Plato's dialogues, they, they end at the, you know, never being able to give us an account of what they mean by evil. Well, they're going to still walk away wondering, why has God allowed that bad thing over there? Mm. Um, and so um, I don't want to push that point too hard, um, that the, the lack of definition or the lack of understanding. I think it, um, it, it best, um, now I, where I think those would, the people that would probably disagree with me are those who uh, do more full uh, or uh, more 
fulsomely uh, endorse the sort of privation view. Uh, and, and it's really a way of trying to clear away some of misconceptions about evil. Um, so I mentioned Norm Geisler. If, yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if any of the people reading or watching this um, are interested in the topic, Geisler's a little book on, uh, on the problem of evil. It's really short, really accessible, very easy. You could make it through in a weekend. Um, and that's one of the things that he points out is that um, if you talk about evil, if you think that evil is a thing, well, there is going to be some problem. Why would God create that thing? And that's, now you have a different set of problems that if you just get some clarity on what evil is, you don't have to deal with those problems. They just go away because evil is not a thing, right? And so um, it can be useful to spend some time talking about the concept of evil just to help sort of make your task a little bit lighter and you're not having to deal with problems that aren't real problems at all, that, that problems that just rest on a misunderstanding of, of what it is that you're trying to explain. Now, those who don't um, embrace the privation view... Um, Which is the majority of people... It seems like it. Yeah. Uh, it seems like it. Um, I, you know, for them, maybe it's not quite as, um, maybe it's for them, they could just say that over there, they point at that and they don't need to do anything else beyond it because the, the kinds of objections that aren't necessarily, um, it's not as pressing for them to deal with that conceptual aspect of it. But um, so I think it kind of depends on maybe like what the task at hand is. Like, um, are you, you, you're trying to help other professional philosophers wrestle through what are adequate solutions or not? Are you trying to help somebody, uh, a family member or someone off the street that you're chatting with uh, at the coffee shop? Uh, if that, we ever get to do that again, uh, given COVID, uh, <laughs> presumably someday you'll get to be at a coffee shop and have one of these uh, alleged conversations about evil. Um, uh, you know, so it kind of just depends on, I think on how I, I, I do have sympathy with people that want to say just sort of why, why can't we just point at it and say, why does God allow that terrible thing? Um, but, it, but at the same time that can invite confusion whenever we're trying to get through it. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of somewhere down the middle of the road on the importance of the, the definitions. Yeah. Is it though, uh, are, are are people more inclined towards not having some sort of definition because we, we tend to be more, um, at least within analytic philosophy, there's a, sort, there's a sense of like a intuition based philosophy. So like, Oh, look, intuitively, I know that yeah. this is, uh, this is evil. Yeah, I, I think, well, I think one thing that is interesting is that uh, analytic philosophers are actually really well known for like their, overly emphasizing the importance of definitions and getting clarity on concepts. And um, I'm not sure the explanation uh, for why that doesn't seem to be the case when it comes to something like evil. Um, I, I think many of the theists, they recognize that there's a problem that, you know, there's a, uh, a, a young toddler that's killed by, you know, his dad or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you just think, why would God allow that? Let's figure that out. And we'll come yeah. back and figure out, you know, what it is that makes something evil later. Let's just try and figure that out. And then once they try and do that, you know, then um, you, you have something to discuss. And so uh, I'm not sure the, the reason why, um, but I, I do think that, you know, there are occasions whenever we, it seems appropriate to just define something by pointing right um and uh, and maybe that's that's it like um you know you you may not need to have a a lockdown definition of uh of courage to be able to point at the firemen running into the burning building to rescue the the elderly woman let's say um to say that was courageous um and you just sort of just see it um and so um the i think probably for in examples like courage and evil both um there are really clear cases of things that are evil or aren't evil or are courageous or aren't courageous where you can just point. Um, the things that are more difficult are the things in the middle, like you're being extremely sore the day after a, a strenuous workout, right? Um, what, how do you do that? And, and maybe right. on those sorts of things, that's where having um, spending some time on dealing with what we mean by the term can be more beneficial uh, because you're, you're now trying to separate out the hard cases. And mm. so, you know, maybe the, the literature has just um, sort of just settled in on dealing with the really extreme cases. Um, you know, I don't think anybody um, would say it's a good thing for the, the, the toddler to be murdered by, uh, by his father. Um, 
And so you don't have to mess with the definition of what it, or the, 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 the details of what it means to be evil because mm -hmm. you just know that's really bad and you're trying to figure out why God would allow such a thing. Mm -hmm. And so you just stick with that. Um, um, you know, I don't know, but maybe uh, we've been doing that uh, for 60 years, 70 years now, at least uh, in, in the, the, the West. Um, and, you know, maybe it's, we've, we've done that enough that we can start trying to move towards some of those harder cases and maybe uh, spending some more time on a, a concept of evil would be uh, a way of helping to uh, disambiguate some of those difficult cases by having a better concept of what we mean by evil. Is the, um, <clears throat> what about the uh, skeptical theist? What do you think about them when it comes to the problem of evil? Yeah, uh, I think I, I, teaching skeptical theism is I think really a fun exercise because um, you know typically in an undergraduate class uh, especially at a place like Tyndale we're not all students but most students are Christians um, most uh, not all but most are uh, believers in some uh, in, in theism in some way and so whenever they hear about the problem of evil it rightly concerns them right and so then you start working through some solutions and then whenever you come to something like skeptical theism and you say uh you know look we, we just we don't have the cognitive capacity to know what reasons there are um you know there are, there could be all sorts of reasons that we just aren't capable of understanding uh and so there could be all of these evils that uh serve really great goods, but just given who we are and given the kind of being God is, we're just incapable of ascertaining what those goods are. And, and so you sort of work through some of the arguments for that sort of a position and students get really excited um, because now like, oh yes, this is great because, you know, um, usually, at least in my experience, most undergrad students um, in philosophy, they're oftentimes, they're not philosophy majors um, and many of them have a pretty low view of our ability to understand the, the deep things of God. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've had students email me or talk to me after class about God's ways are higher than our ways. And I'm trying to make simple the things of this great God. And so whenever they hear this skeptical theism response, they think, ah, yes, this is exactly what I've been saying all along. Who are we yeah. to say? Um, and, and, you know, I, and then uh, whenever you keep talking about it and you say, well, you know, but look, um, does that, couldn't that argument work in reverse? Like, um, maybe we think that there are really good, some goods that come from these various, these various things, but it turns out the goods that we're trying to, to create are actually creating bad, bads. And if we knew what God knew, we would know that helping the little old lady get across the street actually brought about great harm. Um, and so, uh, and then it, it, it um, is, I, I, I go back and forth of how convinced I am of, of skeptical theism. I, I, what I appreciate most about that, of that um, response to, to evil is that it does take seriously that we are vastly different kinds of beings. It's, it, it, I think it forces a bit of epistemic humility mm -hmm. uh, into the discussion, which in my experience is always a good thing. Uh, yeah. that's, um, and so um, I, I really uh, appreciate that. But it, I do see the point of some of those who kind of want to flip it on its head and say, if we're incapable of seeing that good could come out of these bad things uh, because we're so different from God. Well, maybe there's bad that's coming out of what we think are good things. Uh, and so it sort of, there is a concern that it leads to sort of a moral skepticism in general. Uh, so it's aimed to be more of a, a skepticism about evil and those sorts of things. But I, I do think there's legitimate concerns that it does result in a more pervasive moral skepticism. And so yeah. that's, that's whenever I kind of am, am not quite sure where, where I, where I stand. It's something I'm still sort of wrestling with and trying to, to, to figure out myself. You know, there's obviously responses to these sorts of arguments and um, you know, that it doesn't lead to, to, uh, to moral skepticism and then there's counter responses and things go back and forth. But um, that's kind of where I'm at now is still just trying to wrestle with whether or not I do think um you could give a skeptical theist uh, sort of response to the to, to to evil's existence, but not end up in a, a more pervasive moral skepticism in general. Um, so that's kind of yeah, where, where I'm at. Mm. Do you think with the problem of evil, um, the problem of evil is most problematic to use problem three times now for <laughs> Christians specifically because of their belief in Jesus as. You know, we talk about uh, in, in, in the Bible, Jesus talks about how, okay, if you pray, you know, then 
I will answer your prayers or if you ask through, yeah. if you ask the father through my name, you know, et cetera, et yeah. cetera. So is the problem of evil most severe for Christians, do you think? Or because I, because in terms of like theism, you know, you could have <clears throat> me being a, a Thomist, you know, I, I tend towards most of what Aquinas says. And I think I, and I think he's right. And so he has, you know, just, he has the, uh, I think he calls it the universal good. You know, he just says, oh, God, there's a universal good to the, to the evil that happens. And his example is uh, a trivial example. He gives us, oh, the deer that, um, the, the, let's say the lamb that gets eaten by the lion, it's a, um, oh, my goodness, I, this is embarrassing. What, is it, what does he call it? Um, e- evil per accidents. I think that's what, it's either evil per accidents. I think it's evil per accidents. I could be getting my terminology wrong, but it's just evil um, and evil that occurs to something else for the benefit of another. So the, right. the, the lamb being eaten is obviously very bad for the lamb because the lamb no longer exists, but it's good for right. the lion because then the lion's right. you know, continues to exist, continues to flourish. So Aquinas has the universal good. But then if right. you- And in that, in that case in particular, the lion, it's not just that it's good for the lion in that, um, it's not like a sadist who, you know, it's good <laughs> for the sadist to employ. Like, yeah, yeah. no, the, the lion is accomplishing its design, its function. It's, uh, so it's good for the lion in respect to what is good for lions, right? Exactly. Um, sort of in going like to- flourishing. That's right, yeah, it's yeah. It's, whereas the sadist, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the, the, the sadist isn't uh, flourishing in that way, even though he would say it's good for me to inflict uh, an intentional uh, harm. Um, it doesn't happen. So it's, because I I've, I could see people being like, well, uh, isn't it good for the sadist to do that? Yeah. And it's like, well, it's, uh, Aquinas would, dis- would have a pretty clear way of uh, preventing that, uh, that extension of the, uh, of the example. So yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, yeah. that, that's a great, that's a great uh, qualification. So, but you know, you could say, so Aquinas says, oh yeah, that this is universal good for the evils that happen in the world. Fine. But if you bring in Jesus and you believe in mm-hmm. Jesus and Jesus, you know, the son of God, et cetera, et cetera, and whatever else comes with it. And then he makes these other claims that, oh, you know, if you're, if you believe in me, you can pray. And then I will, you know, mm-hmm. if you invoke my name, pray to God, yeah, yeah. to the father. Does it, the universal good kind of disappears because now you're like, okay, if, you know, if something's happening and I'm praying and then nothing happens, or right. if I'm a Christian and my church is being burnt or, you know, I'm in China and, you know, my, I'm all, my whole family's being taken to concentration camps because yeah. you know, I said something against, I don't know, the president. So then at that right, point, right. it seems that the problem of evil, Aquinas is, Universal good doesn't it doesn't seem very applicable anymore. Yeah, or it doesn't seem like it. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And uh, um, you know, I, I like like I mentioned earlier, I don't know my my uh, Aquinas as well as you, and so I'm not sure I'll be able to put it in the context of his thought. But um, I'm inclined to think that the problem of evil, and and sometimes this surprises people when they hear it. I actually think the problem of evil is a little bit easier for us to solve as as Christians. Um, uh, Simply because um, the so earlier when we were talking about the different kind very at the very beginning of the of the discussion we were talking about different kinds of evil and and somebody might say well look um, uh, evil would be very surprising if God exists mm-hmm. right a sort of this existential problem of evil uh, or sorry evidential problem of evil um, evil would be very surprising uh, if God but if if there is no God it's not surprising at all well on, on according to Christianity evil shouldn't be surprising at all <laughs> um, right it it's it's to be expected right uh, I mean Jesus uh, tells his followers you will suffer in my name right and so it's true that he tell he talks in, t- in in places about asking in his name and uh, seeking and, and you you know being given uh, things um, but he also tells us you're going to suffer because of me. Um, and, you know, whenever you, you look through the, the New Testament, there's a lot of believers suffering, right? Uh, the great apostle Paul suffers a, a lot. Uh, and so you actually, the, the surprise goes away on theism. Um, whenever you, you see, uh, yeah, there's evil um, in the world. But it's exactly what we'd expect if you just read Scripture, right? Right mm. from the very beginning of Scripture, uh, not the very beginning, but from the near beginning of Scripture, uh, right? You see, evil is present, right? Um, and and so um, it's it's it, it. I don't think just pointing that fact out 
resolves the problem. Like you might want to say, but why is it present? But mm. it does, I think, help in that it it, it makes it, um, it's not something that we're sort of caught on our back foot about. Like, no, we should be expecting this. Um, and that's the, the, I think the people who it is difficult for are the sort of um, prosperity gospel crowd um, where on, on that, that sort of a worldview, that sort of an approach, um, evil is really ex- surprising that, that at least that uh, it's at least surprising that Christians would suffer evil, right? Because um, if you have enough faith then it all just goes away. Um, thankfully, that's not my view. <laughs> so I don't have to defend, uh, I don't have to defend the, their, their approach. But for most people who don't sort of adopt that sort of prosperity gospel approach to, to, to things, um, uh, I, I think actually being a Christian uh, is helpful. I, I, I sometimes um, think that uh, philosophers of religion, or at least Christian philosophers of religion, uh, will they sh- sometimes can shy away a bit too much from looking at the the exact specifics of the Christian worldview. Mm. Um, and one of the things that so in the book that Paul Helm does is is he he does that very thing as he he uh, looks to the specifics of the Christian worldview uh, and he relies on some of those those resources um, and he's very explicit in saying look. Um, we shouldn't be surprised by this, uh, and here's 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 reasons why. Um, so, in his account, um, just uh, there was another reviewer uh, for religious studies. His name just slipped my mind, but uh, when he was describing Paul Helm's view, uh, I thought it was really clever. He referred to uh, he says uh, Paul uh, Helm uh, relies on the the A team, uh, Augustine, Aquinas, and Alvin uh, for Alvin Plantinga. Uh, so I thought that was pretty clever. The the A team there, I thought that was pretty pretty clever. Um, but the, you know what what I what I like about Helm's approach is he does specifically draw on some of those resources. And whenever you look to the specific content of scripture, like you you people might if you're not they're not familiar with the content of scripture. They may be surprised to re- realize that God tells uh, his people, that Jesus tells people that uh, his, his, his disciples, his, the apostles, all suffer a lot. Um, and so we, why would we be surprised that we suffer? Um, so I, I, I kind of maybe in this sort of response, it's sort of a, a yet another kind of problem of evil where it's um, – so you kind of have this more philosophical problem. And then there's also this more existential problem, like why am I suffering or why is God allowing these bad things to happen to my family or my friends or, or my country or whatever? Um, and uh, for that, I really think it can be helpful to look at the specific instances of scripture and be like, well, we're not that different, right? So why would, why would it, why would Paul suffer and not, not us, right? Why right. would um, why would the disciples suffer and and we not suffer? Like, um, uh, and so uh, I think it can actually be helpful to to do it. So I, I don't know if that answers your initial question, but I I, I don't think that it makes it any more mm. uh, challenging. Um, you just as long as you look at the totality of Scripture and not various passages in isolation, um, then I, I think it actually can pr- provide a, a useful way of trying to help set the context for the problem in a, in a broader way by, by saying, you know, look, um, no, this is something we should expect actually. I, I, when I, when I was first introduced to the problem of evil, I think it was in your class many years ago. Um, <clears throat> and I read uh, John Hicks account. I never, I thought this is ridiculous. You know, I, 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 I never liked John Hicks approach until, uh, until a few years ago. And I kind of went back on it and I thought, yeah, I guess Hick is, I've, I've really come to appreciate Hick's position more so specifically after reading Marcus Aurelius's meditation and in it, he's mm. just like, well, when suffering happens, just, you know, get up, make your bed, go back yeah. to work, you know, and it's, like this yeah. very, it's this very, um, what, what, it's very similar. I would say it's very similar to, um, oh, what is this guy's name? I forget my name. The Imitation of Christ. What's his name? You know the guy who writes uh, imitation of Christ. Frank? No, it's not Francis, is it? I was going to say Francis. Yeah, is I'm embarrassed that it just slipped my mind. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, but uh, you know that guy. You know the guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. very similar because in, in the imitation of Christ, I think uh, he just talks about okay, if you when you do your work, just do it, be thankful, keep your head down and work, and then it mm. really is is pretty much. It sounds it's more like of a stoicism. That. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so after reading that and then having gone back to Hick again, and I was kind of rereading, and I was like, yeah, I, I really haven't come to appreciate Hick's position, but I know that Hick's position is not satisfactory for many people. 
because yeah. he, you know, he just kind of says, well, it, it happens because it's, it's, uh, what's the word he uses? Virtue building or character uh, building? Soul making is usually making. the, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think um, on Hicks account, um, I think the reason that many, at least sort of more traditional um, uh, uh, Christian theists, at least, um, sometimes will bristle at some of Hicks' account is that he he weds it to his overall approach to religious knowledge and his overall approach to uh, to to God or to the 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 real whatever uh, you know the real in of itself or you know whatever it is. However, we're supposed to talk about this, um, and that's that's deeply antithetical to a, a Christian worldview um, where, uh, at least on uh, traditional Christianity, we can know specific things about the one true God. And it's, it's what he's revealed to us in scripture. And it's uh, so, uh, but there are, there's clearly um, a line of thinking in Hick that can be uh, brought into that crit- traditional way of thinking. And that um, you might say, well, why is God allowing this to happen? Well, he wants us to grow from it. He wants us to, and that in how we respond to suffering, we, we have an opportunity to behave like Christ did in his response to his suffering. And we can be identified in Christ and that can help us grow in our, in our uh, understanding and our pursuit of God. And we, it's an opportunity to demonstrate our faith to, um, to pursue God through trials and that in doing so we, our soul grows, right? We, we, we grow and more, more, uh, more like God. Uh, and so there are certain aspects and elements of that, uh, that sort of soul making theodicy that I think can be adopted. And, um, uh, um, probably a more common way that uh, it's referred to is just something like uh, a general greater goods defense, right? Yeah. So that there's, why is there is evil? Well, they're contributing to greater goods. Uh, well, some of those greater goods could be soul making, right? There maybe there's others, but that's at least one of those greater goods. And so um, I think there are certain ideas and themes in Hick that um, I, are that resonate with me kind of like what you were saying. They say, yeah, I, I can see that. I, I understand that. Um, it just, you know, I don't, but I don't think that um, you have to buy his whole right. religious system in order to make use of those things. Or at least I, I hope not. I, guess <laughs> I think he's wrong about all of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think that there's a, there is some benefit in, in uh, having small uh, in creating small sufferings for yourself in your daily life. Mm-hmm. At least that's something that I've, come to realize over the years it's like okay yeah. if i don't have enough suffering in my if i don't have if i'm not uh if i'm not making myself anti-fragile over the course of mm. the week then i become very 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 I, I i tend to do less you know and i become more lazy would be the best way mm. to put it but if i have yeah. more suffering like i say i make myself this i haven't been doing a very good job at this part but you know i've been like okay i'll wake up every day at uh 5 30 go have a cold shower do 50 push-ups do this i haven't been doing a very good job at waking up at 5 30 because now i'm on vacation but um, <laughs> there is that some there is that sense of yeah. suffering where at least in non-developed countries so mm-hmm. i'm from india the suffering is every day is a sort of suffering you know if you're mm-hmm. growing up in a village every day is a sort of suffering you don't really know that it's suffering you know, you're like, okay why am right. i waking up so early to fetch water <laughs> And then, you know, people in over here, they're just like, oh, I need water. You just go to the sink, drink water. Right, right. And I do wonder right. here if with philosophers, some philosophers, not all philosophers, if there is a sort of a, a lack of um, skin in the game when they're talking mm-hmm. about certain things. They're like, okay, I want yeah. to talk about evil, but I don't, you know, I'm just talking about it from afar and yeah, I don't have anything yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I guess it's just kind of two general thoughts. I just at first to your your, your first point, I, I think this is sort of the the point of the various spiritual disciplines, like the discipline of fasting, right? Mm. Um, you know, sometimes we we want to um, over spiritualize these various uh, spiritual disciplines, and, and by, what I mean by over spiritualize them is make them think, oh, it's great and it's going to be fun, and then, but <laughs> I, if you're like me, fasting is awful. Like fasting I hate is fasting. Awful. <laughs> I hate it so much. I'm just like hungry all the time. I'm, you know, like, but that's the point is it's an opportunity for you to, to, I mean, one in, in this very small suffering, you're, you're able to identify in some way with, with, broader suffering and you and like and there are times that i've actually whenever i've been engaged in a fast and i'm feeling really angry because i haven't eaten and i'm hungry and i'm uh, and i think 
there's a lot of people that this is just their daily life. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it can, and it sort of brings to mind people who are suffering in a greater way because I'm intentionally engaging in a very minor suffering. And, and it's totally different than that. Um, uh, in whenever I'm fasting, I know that anytime I want, I can just walk into the kitchen and get something to eat. Right. Whereas there's a lot of people that, that go through this on a daily basis, uh, and they don't have that out option, you know? Um, and so, um, but I, I think that's the the point of it. You know, I, I'm pretty convinced that um, at least many, and I'm sure it's probably true of many Christian philosophers, but just of contemporary Christianity in general is a, sort of a, an infatuation with, with things being fun, like, uh, and enjoyable. And if it's not fun, if it's not enjoyable, it's not worth doing. Um, and like, if, I don't know, maybe I'm just a terrible Christian, but there are times whenever I go to pray and I'm like, yeah, oh, I'm so tired. I just want to go to sleep and I feel like I'm going through the motions, but you know, I do it anyways. And uh, thankfully my prayer life isn't always like that. But if I only prayed whenever I felt like praying, mm. I wouldn't pray very often. <laughs> um, and the same thing is true with, with like something like a, like a fast. It's that opportunity to sort of practice self-denial and those sorts of things. But to, to be able to do that, to whenever you go, when you fast and you practice self-denial and it, it equips you to be able to practice self-denial in other contexts whenever uh, it's there, there's an important uh, reason for it and so um, so I think there is something to that um, now the, the other part of the question though was just about kind of having skin in the game and um, the the late Marilyn Adams um, she, mm. she's she's really great philosopher and um, she's got a book on uh, her, she sort of a whole pr uh, uh, approach to the problem of evil. She wants to focus on what she calls horrendous evils. Yes. Um, we don't have to really get into the details of that, but in sort of, uh, uh, in her book, um, uh, just uh, horrendous evils and the goodness of God. I don't know if that's right or not, but um, uh, in her book at the beginning of it, one of the things that she talks about is that there is a tendency for philosophers to sort of, uh, abstract away and and what and the reason like um that she wants to focus on horrendous evils is because you can't abstract away a horrendous evil uh like whenever you start talking about the details of something just truly truly terrible like so she, she the one one way of kind of thinking about horrendous evils it's basically an evil that the person who undergoes this evil has a good reason to doubt whether it's even worth their existence anymore like it's just a really horrific time and so you know there's you could be, think of a lot of different examples of it but you might think of someone who uh, inadvertently kills his or her own child right just to you know um backs out of the car or backs out of the driveway or something or like and you just think about that and like the the suffering that would be involved there well whenever you talk about those kinds of evils you, you can't, when you start getting details you can't abstract it away and i do think um She's right that it's you. It's it's important to to deal with those sorts of things and to not um, simply deal with a problem sort of from from the airplane, you know, from ten thousand yeah. feet. But to to really specifically deal with. It. Now, I, I at the same time, I, I think. Um, she might over downplay the importance of dealing with it at, at, at a more of an abstract level. Um, Cause if, if you can't deal with just a logical problem of general, uh, if there's no solution to the logic, logical problem of evil, even at an abstract level, well, there can't be any solution to the horrendous problem either. <laughs> right. Uh, and so um, a solution to something like a logical problem is a, uh, is a requirement for there to be any solution to these more specific versions at all. Um, and so, but I, but, but with that little slight caveat, I think she's right that um, we ought to engage in these questions with, yeah, some skin in the game, as you put it, um, and really think about it. Um, and I imagine that uh, philosophers who are more div, um, uh, conversant and familiar with uh, parts of the world that are um, pl places like what you describe, where there's this this sort of regular ongoing suffering, they probably will interact with the problem of evil in a slightly different way, just because mm -hmm. it, it they're motivated for a different reason, um, and it's it's um, you have sort of a different mental image at, at your mind whenever you go and sit down and start thinking about it, uh, instead of just well somebody is suffering out there. Right. It's you know that guy I know is suffering, um, and and that I do think may may change the, the the way in which you approach the topic. Yeah, there's um this is a point that you made uh, like thirty minutes back that I that's coming back to me. So you were, you were talking about how um, for Christians specifically, you could talk about evil in terms of uh, the fall being the the, the catalyst mm. for yeah. evil. Now. I I want to. This is this is kind of off topic, but I do want to know if right now with 
all that's happening politically if the mm. fog has been replaced by uh, you know like what what is the word i'm looking for what do they call it oh what do they call it white no it's not called white supremacy white no it's systemic systemic racism but it is to have like, there's a more specific word that they use within uh, critical race theory that I just cannot remember for the sake of white white fragility is that, that is it white is fragility that? I know oh, that's the book that everybody's white, talking about I've not read it so I don't I can't say anything about it. I just hear everybody talking about it all yeah, the time but I, I I was wondering you know the have we replaced you know have we replaced religious notions of the fall with something else mm. and now we're looking for you know the next the the the, yeah. the secular fall yeah that's that's really interesting and I I mean I I haven't really thought about it. Um, in, in any significant way. So um, sort of trying to just work through some initial thoughts. Um, I think, I think for some, they, it probably is what's, what's occurring, um, especially those who have more explicitly rejected a, a more sort of a formal religious notion. Um, and uh, I think we saw uh, earlier instances of this, and there's this still, still prevalent, but um, uh, sort of the, uh, I think many in the, environmental movement they've oh, yeah. they've sort of replaced these religious notions um with uh, this sort of environmental uh, apocalypticism um and and so i think uh, given how we are created i think we're it's natural for us to search for pervasive answers to problems that we see uh and so if you've rejected religion um if, especially if, if you've rejected some like uh, christianity and uh and it's uh its account for the, its all encompassing account for the problems that we see you reject that you're likely going to try and find a replacement for it mm. um now i don't think there, there's probably only very few who are doing that consciously right they're like well now that we create what else is going to do it because it's not the fall so it's got to be something else you but you just sort of I, I think just that's that's part of who we are as, as human beings as we search for answers to these sorts of things and so um uh you know, some sort of uh, an account of uh, white supremacy or systemic racism or something like that could, could it then becomes the catch-all solution or the catch-all explanation, not the solution, but the explanation for a whole a whole host of, of problems. Um, mm. uh, you know, uh, I read in the I think it was in the Times, New York Times, uh, a couple of days ago. No, it was yesterday. Uh, or maybe it was this morning. I can't remember. Uh, there was a music critic who was arguing that um, uh, the uh, uh, they should stop doing blind auditions for the various symphonies because there was uh, uh, only one uh, black person, uh, only one black person in a particular, uh, I think it was Philadelphia Symphony or New York, I can't remember. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, years and years ago, uh, apparently there was very few women who would uh, perform and uh, audition and, and be selected. And so they started doing everything blind, uh, right? So the people who are evaluating don't know the, the person's race, they don't know their gender or anything like that, but um, which seems like a good thing, like that seems like what you would want. But um, now that uh, according to this one person, because there wasn't enough black people in a particular symphony, that means that there's still systemic racism involved. And so you should eliminate the blind audition. And so you, you sort of, once you have that as a catch-all, you, you can fit all of your problems into it. Um, and uh, um, I, I think that's probably a natural sort of thing to do. So it's, it's understandable. I think it's wrong, but I think it's understandable um, if you don't have uh, what I think is the true explanation mm -hmm. for, you know, why is it that um, uh, it's so common for one race to treat uh, members of another race terribly? Well, because we're fallen human. In, I think the fall is the, the true explanation. And whenever you reject that, um, whatever you replace it with, as you try to solve that problem, you're not going to be solving the actual problem. Right. right. So um, like, like, uh, is there a systemic racism today? I'm somewhat skeptical of that uh, thesis. Uh, has there been? I'm not skeptical of that at all. Like I, I think when you look at um, you know the Jim Crow laws and things like that in the U.S., which isn't that long ago, uh, that was a, a deep problem. Um, but the the the, the, the existence of Jim Crow laws ultimately is explained by people rejecting 
God's plan for how humans interact with one another. And so if you try to just address something like whatever is supposed to be systemic racism, you might think you're getting rid of the problem of systemic racism, but the real problem is fallen human persons. And so that might go away, but just yeah. something else is going to pop up and, right. until you address that. And so I do think, it, like I said, it's understandable if you've rejected it, you're going to replace it with something. But it's um, it, for me, I really do think it's just unfortunate that uh, so many people think that addressing these sorts of things is what's going to bring about change because it it can't because those aren't the actual, those are um, symptoms of the problem. They're not the problem itself. Uh, systemic racism is a symptom of a problem. Uh, yeah. It's not the cause itself. And so if you just deal with that symptom, but you don't deal with the actual problem, another symptom is going to arise uh, at some point and usually not that far down the road. Yeah. There's um, in the book that you mentioned, White Fragility um, oh, yeah. by Robin, Robin D'Angelo. I think that's her name. Yeah. Um, I was watching and uh, watching and reading a review by Glenn Lowry. I think that's his name. He's an economist. He he's, he's black economist. If that's if that's helpful for anyone else, but okay. he was just talking. About, <laughs> he was talking about how it was. Or oh, sorry, it's his friend. I forget what his friend's name is. They're both talking about how it's the worst book they've ever read. And he was, and he goes, yeah, you know. So I, I approached this book and I thought, okay, I'm probably going to disagree with this book. And both, you know, his friends also black. And they both, <laughs> he goes, yeah. And then I read it and it's the worst book I've ever read. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. it, cool, I haven't read it. I, I, I got it to read it um, just so okay. that I'm aware. Because every time yeah. I go on Instagram, one of my woke, very woke friends would be telling me through the Instagram story that I'm racist for okay. affirming, you know, individual rights and right all sorts of weird things yeah and i know i know that we didn't really get to uh, michael russes and eric how do you say wielenberg wielenberg's wielenberg wielenberg's point. Mm -hmm. point but yeah just the, the we have a few more minutes but um would you say so i was reading on the uh, notre dame review with uh Roos. i think he said that there's no I don't, he doesn't hold to an objective morality is that correct? Right. But he thinks that yeah. evil is still there. Yeah. Yeah. So Ruse's chapter was really interesting. Um, and the he starts off his essay and he says something like, uh, let me state, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but let me state out front the most important thing. There is evil. Evil does exist or something. He says something along those lines. Um, and then... Um, then he proceeds to talk about what he means by that. And um, it, according to all of the other uh, authors, uh, I'm still trying to keep my editor's hat on and not pick sides and play favorites and things like that. So, uh, but um, according to all the other authors, he doesn't really mean it. Uh, he thinks that he wants to say there is evil, but what he means is something very different from what most of us mean, mean by evil. On, on his view, uh, evil really amounts to going against this sort of um, Darwinian uh, impulses that we have, that, that we've acquired via evolution. And so um, uh, one of the things that you, we've, we've likely have acquired is the belief that, the belief that uh, morality, including evil, is objective. That doesn't make it objective. We just have acquired the belief that it's objective, right? And so, because that's evolutionarily advantageous for us to have that belief. Okay. Uh, and so, at one point, he he says, you know, look, if we had evolved differently, we would have had um, different sorts of things would have been evolutionarily advantageous, and so we would have had, have adapted in such a way to believe different things about those kinds of actions. He says, you know, the one example that I thought was really striking, and then what I loved about Ruse's chapter is uh, he didn't hide behind, you know. He didn't try and obfuscate. He didn't try and he just like, well, here's it. Here it is. So uh, one of the things he said was, um, how did he put it? He says, um, within the system, and he sort of put that in, and he emphasized within the system, uh, having sex with small children is wrong. And so we have evolved in such a way that we believe that it's evil to have sex with small children. Mm. Um, but as some of the other authors, specifically Wielenberg uh, pointed out, um, if we had evolved differently, we would have had a different system. And if we had had a different system, maybe that system wouldn't have said that sex with small children is wrong. Yeah. Uh, and so whenever we talk about objective morality or objective evil, we usually mean something that's more sort of lasting than 
how the system happened to have developed. Um, and so uh, at one point, Wielenberg says, um, the reader might be confused by Roos's claim that there is objective evil, that, that there, uh, given that he doesn't believe there is objective evil. <laughs> and then in his, his reply, Roos says, uh, he's, he, he quotes that from Wielenberg and then says, you know, news to me with an exclamation point at the end. It was, it was pretty fun to see. Like, uh, I think I enjoyed the, the parts of the book I enjoyed the most were whenever the two theists were really at each other and the two atheists were really at each other. Cause it was sort of, there was like more at stake uh, for each of them to have the intramural debate, you know? Um, and so it was just really, really interesting. Um, the, what the, in his response to Rich Davis's uh, arguments, uh, Roos also added some, some color to the, to the chapter um, by using the example of him having an affair with his colleague's uh, wife and, uh, uh, as uh, him ch choosing it freely, uh, and apparently he did so in response to his colleague having an affair with his wife. And so, uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, philosophy departments in the '70s were uh, a, a different sort of thing than they are today. Um, so that was really interesting. I was like, "Oh wow!" He just announced to the world that he had an affair, and uh, so. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so that's sort of that's sort of his approach is that it's very much a. Um, he, I think he understands the the importance of needing to give an account of evil and not just say, well, it doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. um, just, uh, I think what's unfortunate on his view is, uh, at least my assessment is, is that he doesn't have the resources to really say there is evil. Mm -hmm. um, he, he wants to be able to say it, but I, I think his account of the sort of evolutionary nature of uh, moral notions uh, doesn't allow him to, to really make a, 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 a a robust account of what mm. we what it means by evil and that, i mean and, and that's why his chapter is called atheistic moral non-realism right okay. he's, a, he's, a, he's a non-realist about these things um but he's trying to not have to throw everything out and say well here's what we mean by these things and he thinks that it's still a full and a uh, fulsome account of what he, we mean by evil um but I, I think the other uh, authors are correct in, in that really his, his approach to, to morality itself doesn't allow us to say much about what evil actually is. Um, you, you get all of these within the system qualifiers. And, and I think most of us are inclined to think that evil amounts to more than that. Does the within the system qualification prevent him from committing a naturalistic fallacy when he's talking about evil? Uh, well, he thinks so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, the, I mean, the idea is it's, it's interesting how he, how he sets up the system or his, his, his account. So he, he says, look, um, there's different sort of strategies that species might be, might employ to uh, 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 enhance their chances of survival. And so, you know, one, 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 uh, a, 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 strategy would be to just have lots and lots of offspring and you know so he talks about ants and they have all these offspring and so if a whole bunch of them he says you know if it rains half of them are wiped out but the other half are still there and it's no big problem like you're you're still the, the chances of survival are, are still perfectly fine you're, it's no, no big deal but the other strategy is um, like what human persons do where you have very few offspring and you invest a lot in them. And so uh, his, he's pretty funny in his chapter and he says, you know, look, if um, the mom says, uh, uh, where, how many kids do you have? And she says, oh, well, I have three, but you know what? It, it rained today on, on their way to McDonald's. So I probably only have one now. Like that wouldn't be very good for human persons, right? If we, if we, so what we need is to uh, embrace and, and incorporate uh, certain attitudes that enhance our survival. So this is where he starts talking about uh, what he calls the sort of biological altruism, where mm -hmm. you act in ways uh, that will enhance chances of survival for your, for, for your, your, your kind. Uh, and so to do that, you have to acquire beliefs that make that uh, likely and then make that more likely. And so on his account, is, uh, evil occurs whenever you engage in behavior that runs contrary to this biological altruism that we should have, evolutionarily speaking. Uh, whenever you act against that, that's what evil is. Mm. And so... Um, I, I think that's all interesting and stuff. I just don't think that's what evil is. Uh, I don't think it gets to the core notion of what evil is. Uh, and, and that seemed to be what the, um, the other authors were, were getting at as well. Yeah. 
I, I know you. I know you gotta go, but um, no, we're okay. Yeah, you're okay. Yeah, 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 it's fine. Uh, uh, they, I don't hear the kids wanting to kill each other outside the door, so <laughs> we probably got a few more minutes. Okay. Um, uh, what I was gonna ask you is, um, with with Rusa's account, is uh, what did, what did you call biological altruism? Yeah, yeah. Is that is that is that is that similar to? Um, I think it's called like honest signaling within like evolutionary biology where yeah. I think, I think that's what it's called. Is it similar to that? Yeah, I don't, he doesn't use that phrase. And so I'm not, okay. I'm not super familiar with that. And okay. so uh, that's not part of at least uh, part of this chapter, but it, it may, it sounds Maybe. like it could be related, but I'm okay. not, I'm not entirely sure. So, so Eric, Eric, Eric is the, Eric takes the opposite position yeah. as, and they're both atheists, right? Yeah, that's they're, right. That's right. So, yeah. Go, go so uh, Eric's Eric's chapter uh, I thought was the most really interesting, just because it's a it's a new view. Um, uh, uh, well, it's not new. There's other people who hold it, but uh, I just thought it was really sort of novel uh, novel view. And on his view, so he's an atheist, but he's also a, a moral realist. And so he says, look. Um, Oftentimes, whenever we talk about moral properties, we try and figure out whether a moral property like being evil is, um, whether it's a natural property, uh, so it's, you know, constructed, so something about the natural physical world is what gives rise to properties like being evil or being good. Um, uh, and he doesn't think that project works for, for various reasons. The other solution is to say there are supernatural properties. Uh, and so that's something like um, being consistent with the commands of a loving God or something like that, if you're a divine command theorist, or um, maybe something about design, if you, you know, um, uh, being consistent with the, uh, uh, the, the design of a thing. Um, some, some way or another, it's connected to theism or some sort of supernatural being. And so you can get these moral properties like being good or being evil, uh, either naturally or supernaturally. Um, on both of, both of them, what you're, you're reducing the moral property to something else. You're reducing the moral property to something natural or to something supernatural. And he thinks both of those projects are mistaken. And mm. so what he does instead, which is really interesting, is these, these properties are, are wholly unique. They, uh, they, they exist on their own. And so um, I don't think he would want to adopt the entire system, but um, you might think of them as sort of like a, an ethical, like a, 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 a form of some sort, like think of Plato's forms. These things just sort of exist, the form of courage or something okay. like that. It's something along those lines, or, or maybe um, sort of without having to invoke the, the forms, you might think of them as something akin to mathematical properties, like being even or something like that, um, that they just exist on their own and they're not reducible to anything else. And so on his view, that's what, so um, you have evil properties that just exist uh, and they're, they're not reducible to anything else. They exist all on their own. They're wholly unique. Um, and then these things get instantiated uh, in various ways. And so whenever um, you, uh, whenever, the, to think back to an earlier example, whenever the fireman runs into the fire or to the house and pulls out the, the, the woman, um, there's a, that's a, a, an occasion for one of these ethical properties to be instantiated, um, maybe being uh, morally good or courageous or something like that. Um, but it, it, similarly, um, whenever you uh, intentionally cause harm for fun, um, that's an occasion that brings about the instantiation of an evil property. Uh, the property of being evil. Uh, and so just like, you know, you, you have, uh, you have one apple and then you throw another apple into the, into the barrel and now you have two apples and the property being even is instantiated, right? Yeah. It's just, it's just there, right? Well, whenever you engage in certain kinds of behaviors, uh, evil properties are instantiated or brought about when you engage in different kinds of behaviors, good properties are brought about. Um, maybe other sorts of behaviors don't bring about either good or bad properties, just uh, you know, like when you put on your shoes, um, presumably there are no moral properties that are brought about by the putting on of your shoes, at least in most normal circumstances. Um, but uh, philosophers are good at coming up with thought experiments that might uh, make it such the case that putting on your shoes does instantiate a moral property. But, um, and so um, the, the, it just, these, these things are just brought about directly uh, in a sort of robust way. Hmm. Um, and so uh, on his account, so you, you get, 
the objectivity part of morality because these things, it doesn't depend on, upon what you or I think about these properties. So if we think that um, uh, auditioning people for the symphony behind a curtain is morally good and somebody else thinks it's morally wrong, um, what we think doesn't make it the case that either of those moral properties is brought about. It either is morally good or morally bad or neither. Uh, and our, what we think about it doesn't determine that. And so you get the full objectivity. It's, it's determined by the state of affairs and the world itself. Okay. Um, and so you get all the objectivity you want, um, but you don't have any reliance. You don't have to appeal to theism, uh, which is what many, many Christians will, or at least many theists will say, is that you need God to have uh, this sort of a objectivity. And so um, it was around the time that I was uh, talking with, uh, with Eric about writing the, for, the, for the book that I was thinking about his view. And uh, it's why I'm starting to be less convinced about um, a moral argument for God's existence along the lines of someone like William Lane Craig's uh, arguments. Uh, he's certainly not the only one, but, you know, people will say, um, you know, if there is no God, there is no objective morality. There is objective morality, therefore there is a God. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, I'm not so sure about that because on uh, uh, Wielenberg, he's got an account of objective morality, uh, but without God. <laughs> um, and so uh, you, you have a reason to think that that, the, that it doesn't quite work uh, in that sort of way that you, you you have reasons to doubt the the, the truth of that first premise um, and so uh, it's interesting and I the, the, the title of it has just slipped my mind but uh, William and Craig and Wielenberg actually had a debate on um, explanations of morality um, and um, they had a formal debate and then in the book um, they've had a bunch of different respondents and it's just come out, but I, I've forgotten the title of it, but mm. it, or it's just about to come out. I can't remember uh, the, de the exact details on it, but um, where he sort of runs this sort of uh, account of what he does in the book for about evil. He just doesn't in, in the debate and in this other book about morality in general. And then um, Craig wants to push back and try and say, well, no, you really can't get objectivity. Um, and so uh, can't get object objectivity without God. And so uh, I haven't read the, the debate, um, or looked at the debate uh, yet, but uh, I, th I think it should be really interesting. I, I suspect that if I weren't a theist, I would probably be uh, inclined towards Wielenberg's view because he, okay. he does uh, have, I think, the resources to try and, and say, yeah, you could have objectivity without, um, you could have objective mor morality and, and not have God. Um, uh, the, the, but what is it? I, what I'm, yeah, go ahead. What, what is it grounded in? That's, how would you ground it? So I mean, like you have yeah. within, within like a classical philosophy, you have natural law theory, and you could yeah. you could you could espouse natural law theory. You don't even ever have to invoke God, but ultimately, right. for the natural law theorists, they would say, "Oh, unless you're a new yeah. natural law theorist, then you you're like a whole different ca kind of can of worms. You're saying all sorts of things." <laughs> but the old natural law yeah. theorists, you could yeah. you could espouse it without ever right affirming. Uh, God, but ultimately they would say, "Oh, it, it goes back to God." You know, it's yeah, either it's yeah. just in the divine ideas or something. Yeah. Right. Well, well, I think what he would say is there is no grounding relation at all. It's there, it just, they, yeah, yeah. These that's that's the term he actually used. These are just brute facts. And so, um, you so he might say um, he uses various kinds of examples, and you say, "Well, the theist might wonder, might say something like." Um, God wills that X and you might say, well, why does God will that X? And you say, well, because it was God's pleasure to will X and that's just the stopping point. And you might say, okay, well, well, fair enough. Well, on my view, um, harming someone for fun just instantiates the property of being evil. And you might say, why? And you just say, it just does. Um, like it's just a brute fact. And that, that's the stopping point. Um, and so in various places in his chapter, he, he draws various kinds of analogies like that and says, you know, look, um, theists often will have the same sort of, well, well, I mean, it's right to say, look, uh, explanations have to stop somewhere. Um, and the theist's explanation stops with something about God, right? And his decision to create or something along those lines uh, uh, on theism, that's the, the final stopping point. Well, for him, the, the, the final stopping point is the brute fact, the brute existence of these uh, properties that are uh, robustly instantiated uh, mm. 
based upon uh, the, the 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 state of affairs uh, in in uh, in the world. Yeah, so, so it's it's really interesting how he he kind of um, uses a, a similar strategy. And now you might not think that it, maybe it doesn't work, but you know you'll say things like, um, "Well, look, this is the same method of argument that 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 uh, the theists will employ." Will employ. Um, is it though? Would it be the theist that he may be referring to? Um, what are they called? Uh, the theists who say sacrificing children is bad because God said so. If God said sacrificing children is, what are those theists called? Uh, uh, divine command theorists. Divine or, command theorists. Yeah. Divine yeah. Command. So would would he just be referring to divine command theorists when he's referring to to the concept of God? Because because I mean I'm thinking of like if you're thinking of like the classical theistic understanding of God, the explanation ends only because I know you and, you and I disagree on the conception of God, but at least on our, on the yeah. classical theism, uh, it ends only because God would be, let's say, existence itself in, in words. Yeah. Whereas, you know, divine command theorist, theist, it would just be, well, so X is evil because God said X is evil. There's nothing really right. more to it. God could say tomorrow, Hey, X is right. X is good. Right. Everyone's okay to do it. Right. Yeah. So I think his strategy would probably be more effective against certain kinds of theists than other kinds of theists. Okay. Um, and so if you, um, uh, I'd have to think through that a little bit more, but I think that's probably right. That okay. certain kinds of theists uh, may be able to say, well, well, actually our, our explanation is more fulsome or it's, it's a, it's a deeper, more comprehensive explanation. Um, than what you you're giving for um, uh, ethical properties existing, um, and so how he might respond to that, I'm not I'm not quite sure. Uh, he would probably be worried about some of the the, you know, the coherency of uh, these other kinds of theistic conceptions, um, you know, like you know just traditional stuff about yeah. you know existence in of itself and that, those sorts of things that nobody at least, no at least anybody <laughs> really knows what it means. Uh, but uh, what does what we've been does talking Ruth too say, long, though? so my my real thoughts are going to start popping out here pretty soon. Uh, is is that uh, before we get uh, before we close up? Uh, what does Roos say to Eric's? point about objective uh, morality as an atheist yeah um i'm trying to remember his his response um i, I it's it's slipped my mind in in particular i think he um hmm. yeah I, I, maybe i'm just uh too too tired at this point to recall i can't remember his exact uh i can't remember his is the it, i'm trying to remember how he goes about I think he says something like, um, in, in essence, Wielenberg is too fancy of a philosopher with all of his uh, analytic precision and P's and Q's. And I, that's, that's not what I do. Like he, he doesn't really deal with the, the meat of it. He just sort of says, I don't really follow a lot of what's happening. And so you, whenever you read the book, it's really interesting. Um, both Helm and Ruse, Ruse's chapters are very sort of chatty. Like, uh, and I don't know if it's because they're both British. I, I don't know, uh, but they, they both are British and they both have really chatty chapters where it's very kind of, I don't want to say loose because I think they make precise points, but it's, um, it's very, very accessible. Whereas uh, Rich Davis's chapter and Eric Willenberg's chapter, it's, it's, it's just a, like a tighter argument style. It might be something like more like what you would see in like a peer review journal okay. where it's very precise, very clear. Um, uh, and, and, and I, don't, I really don't want to, I'm trying not to say that in a way that makes the Helms and uh, 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 Ruse's chapters seem less helpful. Cause they, I thought I, it's just a different style of writing. Mm -hmm. And so um I, if I recall correctly, a good chunk of Roos's, at least the initial part of his response, is more commenting on the style of uh, philosophy uh, than actually getting to some of the the detail of what he's he's making. Um, but I, it, I mean, Wielenberg, What's interesting is they they both are so obviously they have in common their atheism, and they also have in common their uh, commitment to evolutionary thinking. Um, yeah. And so, on Wielenberg's view. Um, like evolution is still part of the, 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 the picture, right? So you might say, you might still want to know why is it that uh, people act in ways that, so, you know, so far what we've talked about is what evil is, right? It's the, yeah. the, the instantiation of these properties. Um, 
why are they why are they brought about and and he actually appeals to sort of an evolutionary account of why people engage in the, these kinds of evil behaviors uh and so he says you know look theists will say um so coming back to our discussion earlier about original sin theists will say that original sin is the explanation uh whereas i'm going to uh, give an account of uh an evolutionary account of you know in you know, all sorts of different ways about um competing for resources and, and things like that, um, that we, we have, um, we have this account, the, the, the primary example he uses is what he calls uh, the, the, the phenomenon of dehumanization, mm-hmm. where you, you have a tendency to uh, want to dehumanize others. And once you engage in that dehumanization, uh, it makes it really easy to engage in evil acts towards those who you have dehumanized. Right? So you think about like Hitler and uh, how uh, the Nazis treated the Jews. The first step was to dehumanize them. And then once they're less than human, then you can do whatever you want with them, basically. Yeah. Um, and so um, that sort of, he sort of says there's an evolutionary account for why we engage in that sort of behavior. Uh, and so it's not, you don't need original sin or you don't need the fall to, to, to explain that. You can, the evolution has an account for that. Uh, so so he still, um, like Ruse, thinks that evolutionary um, thinking is going to play an important role in the system, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not the foundational role because to give it that foundational role would sort of try to be a way of reducing these moral properties into natural properties. And that's what he thinks is a, is a, is a mistake. And so it's the evolutionary account really comes into why we engage in these behaviors, not what explains evil itself. And that's where the big difference between Ruse and, and Wielenberg are. Okay. I'm going to have to read this. Um, <laughs> well, good. Mission accomplished. <laughs> this has been a great, great conversation, Paul. Um, where can people find your book? Uh, explaining evil where can people yeah. find you if you're on social media yeah you um, well you can well. get the book at you can get the book at just about just about anywhere amazon uh you know in bloomsbury's uh, website sometimes uh, people don't ever do this it doesn't seem like they do it too often but uh, a lot of times um publishers at least academic publishers oftentimes have really good sales on their own website. And so you can actually uh, oftentimes beat Amazon's prices by going right to the publisher. So, um, but uh, if you're, if anyone's interested, I'm on uh, Twitter, uh, just at W Paul. Uh, and then my, my website's W Paul uh, uh, So um, yeah. So feel free to, to, to hit me up. This has been a lot of fun. It's been good to, to see you again. Uh, yeah, for sure. So before uh, we started recording, I actually dug up your seminar paper that you wrote for me on uh, for the problem of evil seminar and had a good oh, time rereading your, your, your papers many years ago. So years ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. no, that, was, that was a great class. And this was a great conversation, Paul. I was thinking we should do it again, but I know you are an expert in the, in the free will as well. So that's something okay. that would be very Yeah, useful. well, actually, um, I mean, I'm actually um, currently working on another book that I'm uh, uh, authoring, and it's going to be um, sort of going back and, and piecing together some of the uh, work that I did, just looking at uh, the relationship between um, the free will defense to the problem of evil and various Christian doctrines. And so in our seminar that we had together, we probably looked at a couple of these, uh, these ideas. Um, and so, uh, so I'm working on that now that's going to come out with uh, whip and stock. I'm not exactly sure when it'll be in, in press, but, uh, and then I'm, I recently uh, agreed to co-edit a new uh, series with InterVarsity press that uh, some of your viewers might be, uh, and listeners might be interested in. It's called a, um, uh, questions in Christian philosophy. Uh, and so it's going to be a new series of introductory books uh, on philosophy. So we're going to uh, start off, I'm going to write the volume uh, for philosophy of religion. So sort of an intro to philosophy of religion. We'll have, also have one on aesthetics, uh, one on logic uh, that's coming out here pretty soon. Uh, and then our volumes on uh, metaphysics and philosophy of mind. Whoa. I think that's the full slot, slate of them uh, and of the initial ones. And so, um, so that'll be pretty interesting as well. So uh, th- those are the 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 two next uh, big projects that i have uh so maybe at some point uh uh, i can come on again and we can talk about some of what's going on in those books those are that sounds extremely exciting book uh series so yeah well thank you so much have a good rest of the night all right you too bye-bye